Romans 12, 1 through 8. Are we there? Okay, let's read those, those eight verses. Paul says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say, through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function, so we, being many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, Here's the key. Let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches in teaching. He who exhorts in exhortation. He who gives with liberality. He who leads with diligence. He who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Father in heaven, as we look into your word, God, allow your word, Lord God, to move us as well. God, help us to understand that your word is alive and your desire is that we would not only take that in, but let it out as well. So God, again, bless your word this morning in Jesus name. Amen. How many of you guys are familiar with Facebook? Did you guys notice your outline? Did it kind of throw you off when you guys first saw this? Notice it doesn't say Facebook. It says faith book. Our kids today are young men and women. There's a word out there that really, really makes them nervous. It's reputation. You know, they're not kids no more. They're growing up, and they are worried and concerned about their reputation. And I tell them that they need to understand that reputation is based on the ideas and thoughts of other people about you. And the problem with that is if we get stuck in that, We're going to try to mold our lives into what they think about us. And that should not be the way we live our lives. It should not be about reputation, but rather of imputation. In other words, the righteousness of Jesus Christ imputed to us. That is what should mold us and shape us into a community of believers into a community knitted together in Christ Jesus. That is what needs to mold and shape our young people today. And the first thing I want to look at on your outline is that here in Romans chapter 12, there's an invitation. We see the invitation. And I don't know if you've been on Facebook or not, but when a friend wants to be your friend, he makes a request And you will see up there what says friend request. There's an invitation. Either you confirm the invitation or you click on not now. So this morning, as we look at this invitation, this request that is made by the Apostle Paul, we need to walk out of this auditorium after service and really consider if we are willing to confirm or walk out and say not now. Amen. So let's look at the invitation. Let's look at verse 1 again. It says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. That there is the invitation. Now, again, Christ Community Church, Youth in the Word, they just completed their study in the book of Romans. I believe we were, if I remember correctly, we might have been there, what was it, a year or so? It took us about a year to get through the book of Romans. I remember, you know, we covered 16 chapters, covered about 433 verses, covered about 9,500 words. And it took us about a year. We had a lot of fun with it. And youth in the word, after spending about a year in the book of Romans, they have come to the conclusion that justification is by faith without works. And is the righteousness of Christ imputed to the believer in which he is made eternally saved? Amen? Amen. 
For in Romans 1.17 says, For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Now, the invitation that we are looking at this morning, it is not an invitation for salvation. This invitation, and don't get me wrong, salvation is very, very important. The invitation to salvation is very, very important. But this morning, this invitation is not one for salvation, but it is a invitation to every husband, every wife, every grandparent, every young adult, every teenager, every child, everyone from the youngest to the oldest of saints that have come to experience that very work that they've learned about in Romans that Christ has done in us called the new birth. This invitation is to you. This invitation is to live outwardly what has taken place inside of us. It is not an invitation for salvation. And the reason I say that is because I would never invite any of you guys to live an outward life for God without ever experiencing what takes place inward first. I would never teach you that. Because if I did, if I would try to say to these young men and women in our youth group, to begin to live an outward life for God without them ever experiencing a transformation on the inside, I would be setting them up for failure. I would be setting them up to fall. I would be setting them up and binding them in legalism. So it is not that salvation, invitation to salvation is not important, but we have to understand that we do not want to start on the wrong end this morning and talk about an invitation to surrender the outward life unless there is a prior surrender in the inward life first. Even the Apostle Paul, he does not substitute external surrender for internal surrender in this portion of Scripture either. As a matter of fact, Paul has just spent the first 11 chapters of Romans explaining to them, going over with them, the reality of what took place in them. So when Paul is writing here, he is writing, he's actually reminding them of what happened in their lives, their position in Christ. And now here in chapter 12, there is now an invitation or a challenge to take responsibility. There is now a Transformation from what took place, and now he's saying, okay, you guys, now it is your duty to live it out. So this morning, a matter of fact, in verse 12, let's look at it carefully. It says, I beseech you, therefore. In other words, therefore, meaning there's a transition from what he just shared with them to what their duty now is. No different than... In the Old Testament, just as a priest needs to be consecrated before he can offer, in Exodus 28, verse 41 says, You shall put them on Aaron, your brother, and on his sons with him. You shall anoint them, consecrate them, and sanctify them that they may minister. God didn't say, okay, set these guys up and have them minister, and then later on we'll set them apart. No, that's not the way it works. You set them apart first, and then you ask them to minister. We also must first yield to God. We need to be surrendered, set apart to God, before any of our outward deeds can be laid upon the altar as well. In Romans 6.13, And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead. It's very clear, salvation. Being alive from the dead. And your members as instruments of righteousness to God. It doesn't say offer your members as instruments of righteousness to God. 
and maybe in the process, if you do well enough, then maybe you can be alive from the dead. No, we have to get it right. This is why I believe we have to give our young people God's word, God's word. And I will be the first one to admit to you that we do not have a lot of games. You know, when they first come, they're like, wow, you know what? There's not a lot of activities and stuff like that. Well, I'm not there to entertain them. I'm there to give them God's word. Because that is what they need. The invitation here this morning is a friend request from Paul. To lay your life on the altar. We're on Facebook here. But now there is a challenge to join the priesthood, a community of faith, living out a kingdom life. First Peter tells us, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. We are priests. We are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And that is what we need to raise and train our young people to do. And just like on Facebook, here on Facebook, there's an opportunity for you to confirm the request. Or will you say, not now? It's up to you. Which brings us to the second thing is, how is this invitation offered? There's an invitation, we know that, but how is this invitation offered? Well, let's look at Romans 12.1. He says, I beseech you, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, I beseech you, brethren. Notice here that Paul does not issue a command here. It is not a command, but it is a pleading request. It is not a command. You see, my friends, this morning, you need to really understand this, grasp this. Loving service. Loving service cannot be commanded. Loving service cannot be commanded. That is why Paul can only beseech you. This is why Paul can only urge you. This is why he can only appeal to you and plead with you. Paul is saying, I am begging you, please. And you know, I thought of Paul. Man, Paul was one of the greatest apostles, he had great authority. But yet he calls them brethren. This is a term of affection and concern at the same time. He's concerned for them. He's not commanding them, but there's a deep loving concern that believers are not living out what they're supposed to. He uses a plea out of love and concern instead of driving them by force to accept this invitation. But that was Paul. You see, Paul wanted them to respond with a heart that would say, you know what, God? As I consider what you've done for me, I want to offer you my all. There's just something about giving someone an opportunity based on what God has done for them to give back than to hammer somebody and to hammer them and to hammer them. Look what Paul does in Philemon. He says in verses 8 through 11, Therefore, though I might be very bold in Christ to command what is fitting, yet for love's sake I rather appeal to you. Being such a one as Paul, the aged, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ, I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten while in my chains who once was unprofitable to you, but now is profitable to you. Look how he, he doesn't command them. He doesn't say, take this guy into your congregation. He doesn't command them to do it. He says that, you know what, you guys, it's going to be up to you, but I appeal to you. Take him in. He says to them, I don't command you. He says, but it is fitting. See, that's the way Paul offers this invitation to you and I. He doesn't command us. He doesn't want to force us. But just like this congregation here, out of a love for what Jesus had done for them, and understanding that this young man that Paul met in jail, in prison, was now a believer and about to be sent to them, they were to receive him as a brother in Christ and love him 
with a heart that was genuine. Not because he commanded them to. And it is the same way that Paul offers this invitation to us this morning. He doesn't command us. He says, in the light of what Jesus Christ has done for you, I offer this invitation. It's not a command. He allows us to reflect on what's taking place inwardly. And again, you know, God, you're my Father, my Creator, my Savior, my Redeemer. Here's my life. And not only that, but God continues to crown us with new mercies every morning, with blessings. It should cause us to say, you know what, I must yield every part of me to his service. What are we invited to do? What are we invited to do? Well, Romans 12, 1 again. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. What are we invited to do? To present our bodies a living sacrifice. Now, most of us will agree on this next verse on the screen. 1 Corinthians 3.16 Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? How many of you guys agree with that? How many of you guys have read that? Yeah, it's awesome, isn't it? Isn't it great that we are the temple of God and He dwells in us? But look at verse 1 Corinthians 6.19. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in, in your spirit, which are God's. Now, I don't have a problem understanding that I am the temple and God dwells in me, But you know what? When it comes to the fact that I'm not my own anymore, that I was bought with a price and that I need to glorify God with my body and with every part of me, that's where we have a problem. That's where we say, you know what? Uh, That's cool that God lives in me and everything, but you know what? I don't know. What are we invited to? You are invited to give it up. All of you. You as a priest are invited to pick yourself up and lay ourselves on the altar of God as a burnt offering to God. We need to offer our bodies. Don't you know that if it is true that if the Holy Spirit dwells in us, that if God lives in us, God is spirit, how is God going to move through us? What is the instrument that he's going to use? This body. This is the organ that God wants to use here on earth. He dwells in us and he wants us to move. And we will never do that unless we are willing to offer ourselves as a living sacrifice. And here's the good news. You can't keep anything. You got to give it all. Leviticus 1 verse 6. And he shall skin the burnt offering and cut it into its pieces. The sons of Aaron, the priest, shall put the fire on the altar and lay the wood in order on the fire. Then the priest, Aaron's sons, shall lay the parts, the head and the fat, in order on the wood that, that is on the fire upon the altar. But he shall wash its entrails and its legs with water, and the priest shall burn all on the altar as a burnt offering an offering made by fire, a sweet aroma to the Lord. He will burn all. All of it goes to God. This burnt offering, of course, typifies Christ himself, offering himself as a perfect sacrifice and perfect devotion to the Father's will. The offer or the priest got nothing of it. That's why Jesus had to give it all. Jesus was not only the priest, but he was the offerer and the object of the offering as well. 
and he gave it all. It was all devoted to God. So the believer is to live a life completely dedicated to him in which God has absolute right of way to our lives, every aspect of our lives. Again, Leviticus 6, 12, and 13. And the fire on the altar shall keep burning on it. It shall not be put out. And the priest shall burn wood on it every morning and lay the burnt offering in order on it. And he shall burn on it the fat of the peace offering. A fire shall always be burning on the altar. It shall never go out. We want to be spiritual sometimes and offer a day or two to God and, and, and think we're okay. No, the fire never goes out. There always needs to be an offering on that altar and the fire needs to keep burning and it needs to keep burning and burning and burning and burning and burning and we should keep offering and offering our lives every single day. Burnt offering was the basic sacrifice that express complete devotion to God. And this is what we're invited to do. When we surrender ourselves to the Lord, we put all on the altar and hold nothing back and keep the fire burning. The priests also examined the sacrifice to make sure it was without blemish. We too have to give God our best. Not the leftovers. We have to give God the, our best, our all. And here in Romans chapter 12, this invitation that's being offered to us this morning, this is the New Testament peril to this truth. This is it right here. And I have to ask you this morning, will you confirm this friend request? Or will you walk out of here and say, not now? And then the second thing is, why are we invited to begin with? Why are we invited to confirm? Why are we invited to do this? I often think of people who have died for their faith. People who have laid down their lives for their faith. But I am not speaking about Christians. Do you realize that all other faiths, all other faiths make sacrifice the root of mercy? What I mean by that is all other faiths say if you sacrifice, some even to the point of giving up their very lives, they make that the root of mercy. They somehow believe that if they sacrifice even their very lives, maybe, maybe their God will offer them mercy. And yet they lay down their lives. But we serve the living God who has already made mercy the root of our sacrifice. The root of our sacrifice is God's grace and mercy. We are saved by grace. And yet we are not sometimes willing to lay down our lives or offer it completely to him. It's like a flower where the root of the flower is what causes the flower to bloom. Our desire to lay our lives down for Jesus Christ because of what he has done for us, his grace and his mercy being the root of our salvation should cause us to bloom and to say, here is my life, Jesus Christ. I give it to you. And we are saved by grace. So why are we invited to confirm this? Because we have already experienced God's mercy. Romans 12.1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. There's an invitation. He doesn't command us. He doesn't, you know... He doesn't bang us with the invitation. He pleads with us. He tells us what we are supposed to do. And now he's telling us why we should do it. By the mercies of God. 
which is your reasonable service. In other words, in the light of what God has already done for us, we do not serve Christ in order to receive his mercies, but because we already have received mercies, we serve him out of love and appreciation. Unless we think it's cheap grace. There's a brother, and every morning I ask him, hey, what's new? He says, the mercies of the Lord are new every morning. Do you realize how true that is? That there alone should cause us to say, you know what? Yeah, that's the God that I serve. That is the reason I am willing to offer my life. Not only that, but because it is the proper and requested course of action, but also the practical and reasonable route. Put it in plain English, it makes sense. Because it is the proper and requested course of action, but also the practical and reasonable route. I'll try to hurry through this. Now, in Isaiah chapter 1, verses 18 through 20, listen to what God says to the sinner. He says, come now and let us reason together. In other words, we're going to talk about this. Let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So God says to the sinner, let's reason together. Basically saying, look, if you accept what I got to offer, you'll be okay. If you don't, it's bad news. Now, is it true or not? For the sinner, the proper and practical thing to do is to give God his or her heart. Correct? Does it make sense? It makes perfect sense for the sinner to say, okay, God, I give you my heart. But to us this morning who have received mercy already, he says in Romans 12, 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, which is your reasonable service. Isn't it true? That for the saint, the proper and practical thing to do is to give God his or her body? Why does it make sense when we look at the sinner? It makes sense to give yourself to God. But yet, as saints, we struggle with saying, yeah, it makes sense to give my all to God. We struggle with that. Number three, the results of confirming this faith book invitation. There's an invitation to do something. There's a reason why. And then there's also results of confirming this faith book invitation. We'll see it in Romans 12, verses 2. It says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. One of the results or the benefits of Giving yourself wholly to God is that we will not be conformed from without by the world. We will not be conformed from without by the world. And conform simply means to put on the form or fashion or, or appearance of another. It also refers to anything pertaining to habit, uh, manner, dress, and style of living of someone else, in other words, of the world, of the world. Now, Jesus spoke often, when I read the Gospels, Jesus spoke often of the beauty of this world. You know, he spoke of the lilies, of the birds, of the fields, but this is not the world that wants to conform us into its mold. The world that Paul is speaking of here is the fallen human nature, of humanity acting itself out in the human family. You see, just as God says to us, I want your body so that I can act out who you are in Christ, your sinful nature also wants to act out who you are without Christ. And if we do not allow ourselves to be given to God wholly, that world out there will definitely have an impact on us because the world out there 
is molding and shaping and framing human society. And I'll give you an example. And here's the thing. And it will never get enough. It wants more. It becomes more and more depraved. And it wants to act out and act out. And it's molding and shaping our culture. I got to be honest with you. When I was in high school, I mean, a long, long time ago, I didn't hear about parades of homosexuals. I didn't hear about that stuff. And now this world that Paul is talking about is molding and shaping our young people to accept that. Not only to accept that, but to begin to live it out themselves. And if you don't believe that the world is out there doing this, then we need to open up our eyes. If the world, the fallen world, the sinful nature is out there using its body to, you know, live out the sinful nature, then if it's true and if we agree with that verse that says that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit, that God dwells in us, and God is inviting us to offer ourselves as a living sacrifice so that he too can live out Christ in us, in this world. She says, do not be conformed to this world. Don't allow the carnal mind to reign in you. There is a danger. The danger is to live a life alienated from God. Not necessarily, I'm not talking about being unsaved. I'm talking about a life so distant from God that you would not ever know what his will is for your life. Or what he's called you to. Ephesians chapter 4. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have them given themselves over to lewdness to work all uncleanliness with greediness." The only way we can avoid being conformed into the mold of this world is to not only to study, but to apply and in prayer. We need to be involved in those, in the study of God's word, the application of God's word, the taking in of God's word. See, we got a lot of stuff in here, and the only reason we're going to get rid of it is if we put something else in there that will push it out. And the only thing that's going to do that is God's word. Only God's word can do that. And allowing ourselves to be governed by the word of God, to fashion our lives after the example of Christ and not according to the basic principles of this world. Look at Colossians chapter 2. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord. How many of you have, is that you here this morning? Amen. Amen. So walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith as you have been, what, taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. This is what I want for the young people. I want them to be rooted in God's word and established in God's word. Not on the basic principles and philosophies that are out there. Look at verse 8. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. This is what I want for them to be established and rooted. I want them to take God's word in so there can be a transformation, a renewing of their mind, a renewing of what they think, what comes out of them. And it can only be done with God's word. But sometimes, you know, we've created a culture of young people that want to be entertained in the youth groups today. And don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that having fun is wrong. But if having fun takes first place, And the teaching of God's word and the expounding on God's word takes second or third, then there's a problem. There's a problem. And again, unless we offer ourselves upon the altar as living sacrifices to be emptied of ourselves and allow us to be 
filled with God's word, what we are doing is we are failing on putting on the new man that was created in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 4, 20 and 24. But you have not so learned Christ if you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt, it keeps growing corrupt, according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you may that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. And that will only take place if you're willing to carry yourself to the altar and say, here you go, God, I'm giving you all of me. I'm giving you my all. Once we come to the altar, willing to give God our all and taking God's word and allow it to form us, then, then we will be transformed from within by the renewing of our mind. We will be transformed from within. Transformation has to take place from within, not from any external resource, but from God's word that is taken in. Be transformed. The direction here is put on another form. Change the form of the world. Once we begin to renew our minds, we begin to have new views, new understandings, and new affections. We begin to desire the things of God. And then, once God's word begins to govern our lives, then we will be able to discern and perform God's perfect will for our lives. We will be able to discern and perform God's perfect will for our lives. Romans 12, 2 and 3, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You will never know what God's will is in your life until you renew your mind, until you allow yourself to be laid on that altar as a living sacrifice, surrender completely to God, and begin to take in God's word. A renewed mind is necessary to successfully investigate and go after the will of God for our lives. A mind and a heart that would say, God, show me, teach me, lead me, mold me. And the body that is placed on the altar is necessary in order to live it out. God's will in our lives. Ephesians 2.10 For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Do you know what God's will for your life is? And then something very important happens after that. We will see ourselves as God sees us. We will see ourselves as God sees us. Pastor John Gady at an elders retreat up in San Diego did a devotion And he brought out the life of Paul. When Paul began his ministry, when he describes himself, and as time goes on, the way he describes himself, you can see that he's more and more and more and more humble. The longer he walked with God, the more humble he became. But at the same time, the more bold he became as well. And you see, that's how we need to see ourselves. If we give our lives to God, allow God's word to mold us, and allow God to show us the plan and will for our lives, and we begin to live it out, one thing's going to happen for sure. We will become more and more humble. Because we, the closer you get to God, the closer you get to God, the more you seek God's face, the more you realize how sinful we are. And that humbles us. But at the same time, the closer you get to God, the more you understand who you are in Christ. So you can begin to see ourselves as God sees us. And I'm going to close with number four. Facebook friend requests. Will you confirm? Will you confirm today? Will you join the group of believers? Because we need you. Our young people need you guys. 
They need you. And I'm going to close with Romans 12, 4 and 8. Look at this. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function, so we being many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith or ministry, let us use it in our ministry. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. They need you guys. God has something for your lives and I challenge you guys to offer yourselves to God because our young people need you. And not only that, we are going to need them. Just as the Apostle Paul, the very letter to the Romans was not delivered to them by Paul himself. It was delivered by a young woman. A woman delivered the letter. Paul was older. He probably couldn't even see. He didn't even write the letter himself. He had somebody else write it for him, a young man. One day, we're going to need them just as much as they need us today. And if we are not willing to offer ourselves as a living sacrifice for their benefit so that God can fill us with Himself and fill us with His Word so that we could outwardly express what God wants to do in this community. We are one body, many members, but one body. And we all have to work together. Faith book, a community of faith, of believers who work alongside one another to raise them up, to train them, pastors, teachers. They need us. And I guarantee you one day we're going to need them as well. Amen.